Hi, True Seeker here, and I am trying something a little different. Um, so I've got my camera attached to a my phone camera attached to a uh, magnetic holder on my dashboard, and I thought maybe while I had some time, I might uh, make a little video and just see how it works. And I tried yesterday. Uh, I failed miserably. I put up a one-second video and uh, <laughs> a bit of an irony because most of my videos are fairly long and, and uh, those who watch my videos have to suffer through me for generally a pretty pretty lengthy period. But anyway, I wanted to talk about a couple of things that, uh, that about the, the latest uh, series of videos that I've been making regarding the history of the uh, Bible Students Movement, uh, a couple of um, things of note that I think that uh, will be of interest, hopefully, and that will maybe be of some, I don't know, support to those who, when, when, you, when you go online, you know, the, there is uh, really limited, limited information, uh, in a way, uh, when, you, when you go online to find historic information about the Watchtower, about the Bible students in particular, uh, there isn't a whole lot. Uh, there are a lot of Bible student sites, uh, but they all pretty much say the same thing. They give you the same uh, doctrines, uh, teachings. You see the same charts. Uh, you see uh, pretty much one Bible student website. You've seen them all. And, uh, they're they're pretty active on the internet. You you can find quite a number of Bible student websites. Uh, Unlike Jehovah's Witnesses, which are controlled by the Watchtower, and there's only one official uh, website, and uh, individuals are encouraged not to put up their own websites. And that's because of Watchtower's need to control every little aspect of the Jehovah's Witnesses' lives. They're not even allowed to put up a website out of what they believe. But the Bible students are very, very small movement, and there isn't a controlling body. There is a there is a culture, a common culture. There is a set of beliefs. Uh, there is a leader, uh, but the leader has passed on many years ago. But nonetheless, they they, they still revere him as basically the Laodicean messenger, uh, the special messenger of God here on earth. So the reverence for Charles Stace Russell was uh, still very strong within the Bible student movement. But I, I wanted to talk a little about the series that I've been making, and I, I really... Um, I thank those who who appreciate the. There's some nice comments that I've gotten uh, about the about the videos. I'm certainly not um, the orator of um, that. Uh, what's his name? Now uh, deceased atheist. Uh, God, I got a mental block. I hate getting those. Christopher Hitchens. Oh, what an eloquent man. He, he and Richard Dawkins. I just love the British command of the language.
especially the well-educated Brits, they they're poetic. They're they're they just the, the nuances and the words that they choose ring and almost in a in a in a work of art the way they can convey thoughts so precisely in their language. I just wish that I had just the tenth of that ability. Fortunately, I'm stuck with pretty much what I am. And I try, but I'm certainly no orator. But I do think it it's important to document. I mean, at, at some point, if somebody doesn't do this, uh, a lot of information will be lost, and this could be information that could help someone in the future, uh, could be valuable uh, to someone who wants to know from the, the mouth of somebody who had been involved in this movement uh, that directly and at least the person's perspective I can't say that I am unbiased I, I do have my own bias uh, I try to be as objective as I can but there are certain things especially when I will reach the part of this series uh, that pertains to my personal experiences that I can't be unbiased but anyway I just wanted to let my subscribers know that you know many of the things that I've talked about uh, and that I've provided, let's say, pictures, photos, um, sources, documents, things from JW Facts and so on. All of that uh, has been downloaded from the Internet, and there's only a limited amount. I mean, when you look up the, let's say, photos of Charles Taze Russell, you're only going to find so many photos of Charles Hayes Russell online and you, you just not they, first off I don't think he was in the habit of, of taking many photos uh, I mean for he did more so than let's say during uh, you know a person did during the Civil War but uh, you know it's not as though we he had hundreds of photos taken of him during the course of his life. Photography was still somewhat novel, um, although it was uh, extended down to the, you know, it was, uh, now at the uh, uh, sort of a hobby level. I mean, my great grandfather had his had a camera, a tripod, uh, and the magnesium flash. Uh, you see the old flash trays that they held up and they took a picture and they'd light it, literally light it and it would, it would be an instantaneous, brilliant flash and that was a magnesium uh, powder that they ignited and it would light up uh, a room at night and you could take a flash a lot of that was uh, now available to common man, whereas back uh, you know, 50 years prior, when photography was new, the 1830s, 1850s, it was very novel, and only uh, rich people could have photos taken, so they posed in stiff and formal manners, you know, you didn't capture their life. It was as if they were sitting for a painting. It was a little less so than in that 
Russell today. And uh, now that I'm talking more about the Bible Students Movement and the split from Watchtower in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, um, that, that period where the Bible students uh, began to retrench, uh, reorganize, and uh, continue on, separate from Watchtower, um, I have introduced a number of the individuals that were key to that. I have tried to make the connection for people uh, to know that these were associates of Rutherford. These were associates of the Watchtower. They were representatives of the Watchtower on the uh, official representatives uh, on the ordained uh, speakers uh, list or ordained ministers uh, list and uh, they were, I mean that, that was Rutherford's name for it under Russell they were called pilgrim speakers and uh, when the Bible students uh, formed again uh, they are, they, there was another uh, pilgrim service modeled after the Watchtower uh, of Russell's era. Um, I, in my researches, I noted that that list uh, continued to be published. Uh, it continued to grow uh, substantially, and um, and it continued to be published uh, well into uh, the 1960s. I think 1964 was the last year the list was published. And in 1965, I found that the yearbook uh, made note of the fact that this list was absent it did, and not, in sort of an indirect way. Um, oh, they talked about that all Jehovah's Witnesses are ordained ministers of God. And so they're, they're it implied that there wasn't really a need to publish a separate list of ordained ministers associated with Watchtower. And everybody was an ordained minister. So uh, it, it kind of killed one of the last vestiges of the Watchtower's services that it formed uh, as a organization from Russell's era uh, by getting rid of these uh, ordained ministers who were sent out to speak um, to the individual congregations originally called classes. And I also mentioned, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned the key figures uh, that uh, Norman Woodworth, Russell Pollock, John Dawson, Christian Zeno, Jan, Jack uh, McCauley, and you can find all the, their names, uh, George Kendall, uh, and a, a, quite a number of others that I found on the list that were uh, involved directly as uh, Watchtower representatives up until 1928. Now, uh, I was able to provide a few photographs, old black and whites, that I, again, I found on the internet, which got me thinking, because my grandfather, oh, one, one point I wanted to make was, uh, Woodworth, uh, in his bio, made note that, that, uh, Rutherford had get, given orders to the Bethel family uh, and to all congregations uh, when somebody was identified as not being loyal to Watchtower 
they were not supposed to speak to that person or have any activity uh, with that person. And Woodward noted that when he first started the uh, Dawn, it was located on Fulton Street in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn. And it wasn't far from the Watchtower headquarters, uh, which was also in Brooklyn, located uh, on Columbia Heights uh, in 1909, uh, that often they would uh, encounter former associates uh, on the streets and uh, these former, Je now Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, former Bible student brethren, uh, would look straight forward and pass by without acknowledging, without saying hello, as if he did not exist. And it was these uh, strict orders from Rutherford to ignore uh, if he didn't use the word shun, he used the word disfellowship. And uh, disfellowship is a word that was used by uh, Russell, uh, I think in connection with uh, his falling out with uh, Nelson Barber and uh, with John Patton. Uh, John Patton is a, an early Bible student that I, I don't think I referred to much in my discussion, but uh, he was actually an associate of Nelson Barber's uh, initially, and when the split between Barber and uh, Russell occurred, Patton uh, aligned himself with Russell, and he became an important speaker, an important figure in the early part of the Bible student movement. Um, and he would, uh, he did a lot of traveling uh, between uh, Allegheny and Michigan. And, and there were 30 classes uh, very shortly after the formation of Science Watchtower magazine. Uh, there were 30, uh, 30 ecclesias, 30 classes. And they were truly classes in the sense that they were uh, learning. Um, through uh, study, you know, study sessions, uh, the Bible. Uh, they they were beginning to evolve in, in their their form and their format. Uh, initially, it was more study format, but then eventually, uh, a uh, Somebody would, uh, they, they had the elders uh, that were elected, they would give talks, discourses, and um, they would include studies and eventually testimony meetings, uh, which in which everybody participated. I understand uh, from some Bible students uh, that I knew that in the very early days of the Bible students, women did not comment in class. Um, if they were married, uh, they would speak with their husband after the meeting was over. But during the during the uh, Bible uh, student meetings, uh, the women were silent, and that was to follow the the biblical scripture or pattern uh, set by Paul: a uh, woman should not teach. By that, they, they they considered commenting on a uh, on a scripture or thought, uh, essentially as being equivalent to teaching. So that was a taboo at the time. I'm not sure it, it remained that way throughout Russell's uh, life. I think uh, I think it may have uh, lightened up a little bit uh, later on. It was, but uh, early on, it, it, that was the, the situation. Today, I mean, Bible student women do comment. There's no question about that. 
so this fellowshipping uh, was probably what they called it, but it involved, in, in essence, shunning. Uh, so this idea that shunning began uh, in Watchtower uh, later on in 1952, that, that probably is true as a disciplinary form uh, when, when somebody, let's say, did something immoral or wrong or challenged or questioned the authority of the Watchtower, uh, then, uh, then uh, they were disfellowshipped within the ranks of Jehovah's Witnesses. But they were shunning those that were considered to be disloyal uh, as early as the late 1920s through 30s, I know my grandfather was uh, shunned. And, uh, he didn't call it shunning, but he, that's what it was. Uh, he said that uh, the Bible students class uh, split, and he uh, knew uh, and would run into uh, former Bible student associates in town uh, that would no longer acknowledge his presence or existence. Uh, they would uh, walk by without acknowledging him, look straight forward. Brought, Wood Woodworth reported the same behavior. Uh, he said that it was uh, by instruction from Rutherford, who had actually disfellowshipped uh, Norman Woodworth directly. But I, I, I showed uh, photographs of a number of these individuals, and again, these photographs, I'm sorry about the, the way the light is uh, shining right now, a um, number of these uh, photographs I, I just downloaded uh, from the uh, Dawn website, but I have hundreds, if not thousands, of slides. Uh, that my grandfather took uh, beginning in the early 1950s. And many of these were uh, Bible student conventions, uh, IU. Now, uh, the Bible Student General Convention uh, was something that began in the late 1930s. Uh, during that time when the Bible students were starting to come together Frank and Ernest radio program was drawing the Bible students together, and the um, and the and the movement was beginning to to start to reform, regather, retrench uh, from the scattering that took place in the late 1920s and through the 30s, it was an awful lot. Um, now, most of these Bible students uh, were gathered under the auspices of the Dawn's work, the Frank and Ernest radio program, and the Dawn magazine which was originally called Radio Echoes, but within a few months they renamed it the Dawn Magazine. Now, I mentioned last time that the Dawn didn't have the funding to record uh, the radio programs. Um, they did an initial shot of about 13 programs in uh, 1932, and then the radio work kind of dropped off. It was during the, the heart of the Depression, and Bible students were the richest uh, people. Uh, but they uh, they were able to maintain the printing work of the uh, Dawn. And there was enough, enough of a nucleus of a movement to contact sort of lost Bible students um, would contact the Dawn and, and they would send uh, 
Christian uh, Zainal, Brother Zainal, uh, to the class, and he would, uh, or to a brother, and he would look up uh, a number of brethren in a region that had contacted the dawn, and then he would organize them into an ecclesia. And so he was responsible uh, throughout Canada and uh, the United States in forming uh, a whole bunch of Bible student ecclesias during the 1930s. And then by the late 1930s, uh, when my grandmother uh, made recontact with the uh, on through my great grandmother that is and she said my grandmother met a Jehovah's Witness and thought she recognized the message as the truth and my great grandmother uh, she told my great grandmother I, I rediscovered the truth and uh, she my great grandmother warned her you stay away from those people uh, those those aren't the truth they aren't the truth brethren and uh, my great grandmother, uh, apparently, this little exchange they had um, made her long for the old days when Charles Russell was alive. And feeling nostalgic, she took a walk through uh, Brooklyn and she just happened to walk down Fulton Street and she looked into one of the shop windows and there was the Studies in the Scripture series featured in the window, and she looked in, and there was a printing press, and there was Norman Woodward sitting at the press, and uh, the the Mitchell brothers were working in the uh, shop. Uh, it was a very small print shop at the time, and uh, this must have been sometime in the uh, mid-1930s, and that's how she reconnected with Bible students. Uh, she she did not want to make. You know, she did not like Rutherford for one thing, and she didn't think that the, that the truth was any longer being taught by the Watchtower. And uh, so she came back home all excited, and she called them and told my grandmother that she had rediscovered the truth. My grandmother began to attend meetings uh, along with my great grandmother and my great grandfather. Again, they had they had uh, left the organization when Brotherford became president in 1917. Uh, they, I think, the infighting and the, the the fact that there was a dispute and Brotherford was not a very personable guy. He was. Uh, not a very friendly sort, uh, just put them off, and they just fell to the wayside, uh, fell away from the watchtower pretty early on without associating with any Bible students. So when she found the dawn in 1936 or so, uh, she was uh, elated, and they began to attend the meetings again. And my grandmother, um, she she uh, took to it pretty rapidly, and my grandfather, who uh, was born and raised a Presbyterian and uh, really didn't want to have anything to do with the Catholics, uh, they were pretty pre prejudiced in those days about such things. And uh, my grandfather was raised uh, to uh, dislike Catholics, even though his stepmother, uh, after his mother died of tuberculosis when he was 12, that impacted him in a very hard, very hard. Uh, my grandfather uh, would get teary over that, even at age 87. So that was, uh, and he lived to 93. And that was a traumatic experience for him. And my great grandfather uh, got married uh, to a woman 
who had, he had been seeing uh, before he had married my great grandmother, and she agreed to take on a, uh, a family of four boys. And then uh, they had a child of their own, my uh, Aunt Lillian. She was the youngest of my grandmother's siblings. Uh, so he had four full brothers, uh, two older and one younger, and his half sister. And uh, she um, and, uh, she was from the union of um, my grandfather and. Uh, grandfather's stepmother. Now, she had been an actress and had never married, and she was a devout Catholic. And my grandfather and his brothers who didn't think very kindly of Catholics. So it made for a tense uh, family situation. And I have to really give her a lot of credit for stepping into a situation like that. But um, she was a she was a good person. So my grandfather wasn't too terribly inclined. He, he had actually uh, pretty much stopped going to meetings uh, of any sort, of uh, you know, church of any kind. He was he was born Presbyterian, but he didn't really attend any any church at all, really. And now my grandmother is turning religious on him. My mother was already a preteen. And uh, my grandfather uh, didn't really want to get involved in all this, but um, he, he was accommodating to my grandmother. And uh, so she was going to a midweek meeting at the uh, Mitchell's house, Martin Mitchell. Uh, Martin and Roy Mitchell were twin brothers who, I think Russell thought this was funny, uh, they were made the doormen of the New York Temple when Russell was alive. They were identical twins, and they were, uh, they dressed, uh, they dressed, exactly the same, and so you had uh, these twins who were acting as, as the doormen for the New York Ecclesia. And uh, Russell was a stickler for time. If you were, you know, you could be a minute late. The doors were locked. Once meeting started, the doors were locked. And Russell would go on for two hours. Uh, if you didn't get to meeting right on time, you got locked out. <laughs> and uh, the Mitchell brothers, the twins, they, they would see to the doors being locked. Well, the, the Mitchells, they, they too did not like uh, what was going on under Rutherford. They left. And, uh, they joined the New York uh, Bible Students of Asia which uh, was really the main ecclesia that supported Dawn. And, again, I, I provided some photos that I found on the Dawn website, uh, of black and white photos. And, uh, but I, I, I realized that my grandfather would have taken up photography in uh, 1951 or so, very early 1950s, before I was born, uh, he, he began documenting a lot of these conventions, uh, especially the General Convention. Now, the General Convention evolved out of the Midwest. Uh, there were a couple of large Bible student ecclesias independent of Watchtower, uh, Detroit, had uh, a couple hundred, maybe several hundred uh, Bible students. Uh, the same with Chicago. Chicago, for the longest time, had the most Bible students of any ecclesia in uh, the United States. In 
fact that the so large they decided that they they would actually hold uh, two separate uh, meetings on Sundays uh, they, even though they were one ecclesia uh, they just it was too big uh, they they were they were like a convention every every week. And so, uh, while the elders were all elected by the body of uh, membership of the Chicago class, they they uh, they had uh, two separate shifts. Let's put it that way, like uh, like a manufacturing facility running uh, three shifts a day. So. But my grandfather began taking uh, a lot of photographs in the early 50s of the Indiana University Convention. Now, the Bible students uh, started uh, the general convention. It was it really kind of spinned out of the Midwestern Convention, but then it grew to be the National Bible Students Convention uh, by the late 1930s. Uh, the first Bible Students General Convention. Now, th this is separate from the Reunion Convention, which occurred at Allegheny in 1929 at the Bible House. And they had a number of those that they, they kept uh, year after year. Um, I think that eventually evolved into the Pittsburgh class, uh, Pittsburgh Convention. Uh, but the Indiana University in Chautauqua, Bowling Green, Kentucky, Bowling Green, Ohio, these were all uh, uh, general conventions that, that kind of spun out of the Midwestern Convention. I think the first Bible Students General Convention was in Chautauqua. And it was an outdoor convention. It was held in the summer. August, I believe. It was pretty hot. Uh, my mother and my grandmother attended that uh, in 1938. And they had a uh, they had to camp. They had a tent. And I found a photograph of my grandmother and mother as they tented uh, at the uh, Bible Students Convention. And so... I realize that I have all these photographs. These aren't on the internet. I, I at one time thought maybe I should just give them to the dog uh, because I was use But now that I'm making these videos, I, I decided I'm going to use them. Uh, my cousin very graciously uh, offered to take the slides because my grandfather only took slide photos and they're in amazing condition uh, for the age of these things they're, they're almost they're approaching 70 years old uh, most of them and or many of them 60 to 70 years old and uh, they are in better condition than I've been actually uh, they he offered to uh, digitize them, and um, so I'm going to. I, I did have some uh, paper photographs, uh, and uh, I'm going to try and put some of those up uh, in my next uh, video. And uh, over the course of time, as my cousin uh, gets around to digitizing these uh, photos. Uh, I'm going to try and, and put up those that I think are relevant and interesting. Um, maybe I can even give some names. Uh, uh, of course, my memory is is not so good as it once was. Uh, so I, I might not uh, I might not be able to mention names. And anyway, names are only really something maybe meaningful to me, I, I don't know, or others who maybe remembered uh, these individuals, but um, not necessarily of any import to anyone else, but 
you know, they, they at least, uh, who knows, maybe someday somebody might do some research in uh, these individuals, uh, at least uh, you know, we'll have some names. Uh, maybe I can relate some stories about these individuals uh, as I post the pictures. But one of the things that I was thinking what is important about these photos is that rather than having something that I, I'm just downloading that anybody can download off the internet, these are unique photographs of Bible students at convention uh, taken by my grandfather. Um, I need to speak a little about my grandfather. He was uh, a very unique individual. In fact, I, I've had several uh, white, interesting family members uh, and accomplished uh, from both sides. Uh, let's see, from my uh, mother's side of the family, uh, my father's side, and um, and I married into a very accomplished family. Uh, but you know, uh, people, it's always that six degrees uh, separation. Uh, my grandfather uh, started out at the uh, Bank for Savings, which was the oldest bank in New York. It was the first bank in New York City. And um, they called it the Beehive Bank for savings. Beehives were these conical-shaped or dome-shaped uh, baskets that they originally made beehives for honey. Nowadays, they use boxes, trays. Anyway, the old-fashioned beehive was sort of an upside-down basket-looking thing, and that was the symbol of the bank. And my grandfather's boss, direct boss, uh, was William Howard Taft II, who was the nephew of William Howard Taft, the president. And my grandfather also worked with uh, the, another banker by the name of Archibald Roosevelt. He was the son of Theodore Roosevelt. My grandfather called him Archie. So my grandfather moved in some interesting circles um, of landed, uh, sort of blue blood American uh, New Yorkers. Um, I'll mention his involvement in enriching a bunch of Bible students later on in, in another video. Uh, I also had a, um, an, a, a couple of aunts that were uh, very accomplished in mathematics. And in fact, one who uh, was uh, very instrumental in tiling. Um, and uh, the very famous... Uh, a physicist, mathematician, uh, Roger Penrose, the Brit British uh, astro or cosmologist, um, uh, he is uh, he is also famous for his tiling, uh, Penrose tiling. And he did a lot of the same work that my aunt, uh, who was an amateur mathematician, uh, did, and she's uh, she's noted in uh, Wikipedia. Uh, she found a, a whole number of um, tessellations that uh, that people didn't think were possible, and so she she's got quite a bit of notoriety. So I, I have some uh, very fascinating and interesting family members uh, on both sides, uh, despite uh, being Bible students, uh, but. I'm going to cut it short here. Uh, I made it home, and I will try and upload this video to the YouTube. Uh, I don't know how successful I'd be yesterday. It didn't work out very well for me. So, anyway, this is True Seeker saying uh, so long until next time.